university. I, I'm based in the physics department, and I came, come originally from uh, particle physics, uh, a relativistic part of physics point of view. And you'll see that reemerge later that my heritage comes back to bite. But I got more and more interested in the statistical physics side and complexity, and therefore more in social networks, in part inspired by the rise of big data. So you can actually test things. And I was getting frustrated in particle physics. You can <laughs> test whatever you do. Um, anyway, now, what I've become really interested in terms of networks, in particular, is when there's a constraint on the system. So most of my contacts at UCL are actually with CASA within the Bartlett School of Architecture. They're interested in spatial systems, you know, the transport systems within the UK. So you're constrained by two-dimensional, uh, essentially, Euclidean space. Um, and that's led to links with the archaeology department here as well. However, that's part of my work. Another side, though, I, because I'm a physicist, we're taught very much about how there's space and there's time, and there's a lot of similarity, but there are important differences. So I got very intrigued by how time uh, would be, um, the constraint of time would affect the way we look at networks. So that was the background for the work in this talk. Is it ever going to go forward? I'm not sure yeah. why the pointer wasn't working. Yeah. Uh, Maybe the pointer would work now. Right. Well, that'll do. That'll do. Mm. Yeah, something's working. Um, OK, so there, I, I'm not going to get through all this material. What I'm going to do is this has been a, a strand of work for the last sort of five years, part of my work. Uh, I'll work through sort of the. Uh, earlier parts, the later parts I talked about at uh, Singapore, which we may not get time to cover, um, but anyway, let's see how we go. Um, so, um, let me start off right at the beginning, something that uh, whenever I talk about graph theory or networks, uh, I've always been very interested that it's a set of two things, a set of nodes and a set of edges. And we shouldn't think about that. We very often get very focused on the nodes, which most of my talk will be uh, focused here. I was very interested, you know, Paolo yesterday was talking about link prediction. Uh, links are very important. And for me, the whole point of network theory, rather than doing complexity or some sort of statistics, is that even if I'm looking at pairs, relationships of pairs, that's what an edge is capturing, networks are far more than that. Because otherwise, I just do statistics of pairs. And it's all about how those pairs interact together, if you like the higher order structure, that this and this have got some sort of indirect relationship because of the other edges. So if there's any point to doing a network analysis or using the network picture, it's because there's some sort of higher order interactions, longer range interactions, uh, that are relevant for the problem you're looking at. Um, so, as I said, I'm very interested in time and networks. Now, Almost all examples I come across when I go, well, most presentations anyway, uh, look at what I call temporal edge networks. Other people just call them temporal networks. And in fact, you get whole books these days. And that, that's been a popular area for nearly 10 years now. I mean, of course, it's been around before that. Because a typical example is where this is where the, the time is associated with the edge. So the people, for instance, exist forever. Um, these are different people emailing or phoning each other. These are communication links that happen at a particular moment in time. Um, and that's great. I mean, there's a large number of applications for that. I got interested in a different type of network where the time is on the vertex. So you could call them temporal vertex networks. Um, and each point represents some sort of event that happens at one time. And because of that, you've got this natural order, or strictly a partial order, in the, in the vertices. So here, if I'm thinking in terms of time, uh, yeah, one event can only lead or affect a later event. Uh, so this is giving us a very different structure in the graph. In particular, there are no loops, and there's a direction, that, yeah, at least in the natural representation, that reflects this order, this time that's appearing. So of course, talking to a computer science department uh, group. So this is very natural. Uh, it's a directed acyclic graph in 
if you're being more rigorous. Each of these directed acyclic graphs also define a, a post set. Uh, it's a unique partially ordered set, post set, although many uh, different directed acyclic graphs represent the same post set. So there's a link here from the sort of computer science literature on typical algorithms you might use on a DAG. That's my, I should probably call them DAGs just for simplicity for the rest of the time. Links through to a lot of literature uh, in discrete mathematics. You get uh, bogged down, well, I get bogged down trying to read my, uh, you know, well, mathematicians never put a picture in their, pi in their, in their papers if they can help it. Okay, uh, it's very interesting when you cross boundaries just to see how we work in very different mm -hmm. ways. Uh, it's frustrating and uh, challenging, but interesting too. Okay, the many applications. I shall focus probably on the first, just because I have access to what's well, relatively easy to get open uh, access data. Uh, plus, I can interpret the context of academic papers, uh, less so patents or court judgments, but anything where you have a document printed at one time, well, there's another story there about that technically there'll be a date stamp and the bibliography can only refer back to older papers. So it's a very natural, the citation network is very natural. If you like, the innovation works, flows, the ideas flow in the other direction. But there are many other examples, verified transaction networks, cryptocurrencies, the transactions there. I've been a bit frustrated trying to read by IOTA. Um, it doesn't always seem to be as uh, distributed as I hoped it would be. Uh, flow of projects, I think that's the classic scheduling problem of directed uh, direct acyclic graphs are used in computer science, trying to distribute tasks between processors, you know, trying to decide whether to build the roof before or after you will put the walls of a house up. Um, something I've always wanted to tackle that I'm sure big banks have got massive spreadsheets. And of course, in a spreadsheet, the formulae can't form a loop. If A1 uh, plus B1 is the entry in C1, you can't have cell A1 depending on the result in cell C1. Now, they, yeah, my spreadsheets are tiny. It'd be very boring to analyze this. But they actually, the logic in any proof, any mathematical proof, as much as in um, spreadsheet they have to be represented by a directed acyclic graph. Um, and then finally, just to reflect the people around me in the theoretical physics group, there's a lot of interest in these types of graph as a, uh, a, a niche area of quantum gravity. The idea being that maybe we can't quantize gravity because we're, we, we've got space-time all wrong. It's not a nice continuous manifold, as Mr. Einstein told us. But really, at the sort of Planck scale, fundamental level, we've got little points in space-time, and then they're connected if they're causally connected. And so people like Faye Dauker, who's just around the corner from me, uh, playing around that. And I, I like that. I think it's a very intriguing approach. Not clear if it will work, but it means a lot of the models and some of the work I refer to or uh, uh, get inspiration from actually has come from that space-time background. Okay, so that's the applications. I've sort of told you the, um, the my sort of conjecture, the sort of the base of the thesis for my work, is that if there's a time constraint and that's part of your system, that should be reflected in new network methods. You can't just pick up an existing one and expect it to work. Uh, typical network methods from social network analysis have been developed for things like friendship networks, where I can be a friend with someone in Australia just as easily as I can with someone in this room. And so most of the existing simple, the, the ones you learn first aren't really appropriate. Well, may not be appropriate. You should re-examine whether or not you should use them. You shouldn't just pull something off the shelf. So um, these are some of the ideas I could cover today. I'll only cover some of them. Uh, we'll start off with a simple visualization example. Okay, so let, a very quick example of how you can use directed acyclic graphs gives me an excuse to introduce uh, one of the mathematical models called cube box space, or just cube space. This is done by some bright, literally Brightwell and Barnas, uh, some of the leading graph theorists uh, around, uh, Graham Brightwell. Is at LSE, Bonabas, I think, is in Cambridge. 
It's a very simple idea. Suppose I'm going to, I've got a group of objects. I'm going to show you some journals. So we're academics. Very, we ought to know what journal is the best to publish in, or rather the people who are about to give us a pay rise want to know if you're publishing in the best journal. So suppose I rank all the journals. You know, this is A is first, B is second, C is third, D is using maybe impact factor. But there are many different measures of quality or impact. So perhaps A, by the second measure, maybe this is eigenfactor, so one that Elsevier, uh, I think, owned or worked with. So A would be first on eigenfactor, C second, B third, B fourth. Now if you arrange them using these, uh, either the ranking or the rating, it doesn't matter if it's an integer or not, if you use these as the coordinates for points, the idea is that if you make a little square, this is the cube, in higher dimensions it would be a cube or a hypercube, and you connect to anyone that's in this square going uh, up and right. So C beats D on both measures. It's third on this one, second on here, D was fourth and third. So you make a connection to anyone whose rankings are lower than yours, all your rankings. B and C are not connected, because C is third, B is second by this measure, but it's the other way around. So B and C are not connected. And now you can see not that the order we've got is not actually time, the one I've emphasized, but it's now an order in terms of a sort of hierarchy, who's better than who. But because B and C, um, you know, B beats C on one measure but not on another, we've got this partial order. We're not going to say whether B or C is better than each other. Now, I'm not going to take this very far, um, it's just a useful model, and I'll mention it later. Uh, I'll just show you the result. I was very pleased when I came up with this idea, because I didn't know what to use in this box space. Is it al algebraically, it's a really simple example. It's much easier than Minkowski space to work with. So quite a lot of the problems, I work first in the cube space, and then I try a more, more realistic, a, a different model. Uh, and then I thought of an example of how to use it, and I applied it to journals, it's got Nature, New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm rating them on impact factor, eigen factor, and something based on altmetrics. Altmetric.com uh, has a rating of journals. So much more based on social media, uh, things like that, and downloads, or blog mentions. And what you see is cell, clearly is secondary to that. Uh, PNAS, science, are right at the top, but not quite as high as uh, clearly, it's the medical uh, articles that are pulling things up. Uh, PRL does quite well, considering that it's just physics, applied physics letters. Yeah. So, you can go on. Sadly, though, it turns out Mr. Brueggemann uh, had thought of this idea about uh, 25 years before, but that's yeah. you know, so often the way, isn't it? Okay. So, that's a very simple example, actually, not. Yeah, where in fact I didn't use time, I just found a, an order, and here I was using it mostly for visualization purposes. That's fine. So that's great. Let's now start looking more at the properties or thinking about the properties of these directed acyclic graphs. And again, perhaps in this audience these are more familiar, but for someone who just seen generic graphs, I hadn't appreciated all the special properties these graphs ordered by time, with a strong sense of a partial order, um, the extra properties. So let's start with transitive reduction, it's one of the simplest things. Um, so suppose I give you a directed acyclic graph, these could be papers, I imagine time going up, so the bibliography points backwards from paper to paper to paper, whoops, whichever way you write, that's fine. Um, and of course, not all papers cite all the papers in the past. Uh, the information can flow in directly. So if this is a citation network, this paper here does cite the older <coughs> paper. But this paper up here, information could have come from the earlier paper, but it's not come directly. But if you look at this, then you can say, well, I get the same causal structure, the same relationship, if I take this edge and this edge out, because any information flowing up here could have gone through those two steps. So in terms, if you want, uh, of the partially ordered um, set that you can define from here, this is transitivity, if A implies B, B implies C, I don't need this link. So in uh, transitive reduction, you take away all the links that weren't needed to define the causal structure, if you like. Um, 
and this is called a Hasse diagram. So, so oh yes, it goes away. So this would be the transitively reduced graph. Of course, there's a complement to that. You can add every single link in that's uh, implied by the relationships. So this link to this link. Uh, the information can flow from here to here, so I can write a, part, uh, a directed acyclic graph with those edges in transitive completion. And that's also uniquely defined. Uh, turns out, yes, both these are the transitively reduced and the transitively complete graph are unique. So for any DAG, I can either go down or up in the number of um, edges. And in fact, there's a whole family, a large family of graphs in between, where the edges that are being added and removed, you can put as many or as few as you like in, and you get a DAG, and they all represent the same partially ordered set. So uh, a real social network will end up somewhere in the middle, my quantum gravity people, for them, if you're connected uh, causally, you're connected for them. This is the graph that's most important. Most diagrams, say of a partially ordered set, will use this because it's less cluttered, but they actually mean the information is, is that. So there seems to be a sort of gap in the market that at least in many of the contexts I've, uh, or some of the contexts, they haven't really thought about, well, what happens when the real world lives somewhere in here? So that's sort of part of the motivation I had. Um, another way of putting it is that I can imagine that there are two types of measure you might uh, come up with when you're studying these graphs. Some of them are not sensitive to where you live on this graph. They're only picking up the causal structure. Now, if that's key to you, then that's great. And I'll talk a bit later about um, the longest part. Actually, that comes in more in some of the more optional parts of the talk. Uh, turns out in any of these graphs, uh, there's a very sensible uh, definition for the longest path. The shortest path varies between two nodes, varies depending on how many edges you put in. The longest path doesn't, which is a sign that the longest path may have some more significance here. Um, on the other hand, what I will talk about now a little bit, very clearly, if I measured something like the degree here, the degree varies for each node depending on how many of these extra edges are, are present or missing. So that's a citation count in our context. That's going to be used to measure the impact of our graph, uh, of our papers. How good is our paper? Well, how much impact? Um, yet, yeah, looking at this, it, well, it, you know, these these are edges. Depending how many you know, cite, so what papers people decide to put in the bibliography, you know, it, it's clearly not reflecting the true underlying uh, cause of structure, the flow of ideas. So are, do citation counts capture uh, the right information? So that's the sort of conjecture I had, that if you look, took a citation graph and then you took the transitive reduction, what it's doing is it's removing all the unnecessary and indirect influences. Now I'm not saying every single citation to an older paper was completely irrelevant, that you didn't read that older paper, that you didn't really get a key idea from the older paper. I am saying that you might not have got anything useful last time you cited Barabasi and Albert or maybe Einstein's GR, original paper of GR, you didn't really read, read it, did you? Uh, but you sort of learned and absorbed it. You probably picked up an idea from a more recent paper. That's what inspired you. And you know, for sure, Barabasi and Albert may have inspired me or other people to work on networks, but whether it was directly related, I don't know. I mean, I can't say either way. I mean, I couldn't tell you whether this link was vital for your work or not. So, but you could, that goes both ways. If I keep all the links in my citation network as given by the bibliography, that would be enough of that. You know, I might have used that reference. I might not have. I might just have put it in because he's my friend. Um, the other extreme, I'd suggest that if I take all those redundant ones, retain the basic minimum I need for uh, the causal structure, maybe that's some sort of lower bound, and the reality of how influential a paper is lies somewhere in between. Uh, yeah. So, uh, what I'm suggesting, oh, that's come, that's right. So, in fact, there's good evidence that these um, links that can be removed by transitive reduction are, oh, I've put the arrows the wrong way, that's always a problem. I change my mind sometimes about mm -hmm. time's still going on. Um, 
there's at least, I, I, did a, I did a study myself in a completely different way, uh, independently with a couple of students a few years ago. And more interestingly, there's a very early study by Simkin and Roy Chowdhury who studied errors in, in uh, citation. So if someone copies a citation from an earlier paper and they copy the error across, that indicates at the very least they, all they've done, well, the most they've done, the minimum they've done is read the bibliography. Not clear they actually read the paper. And, and who, yeah, we've all looked up, it's easy to look up a citation by looking up a paper that has it, maybe. So by studying the statistics of uh, errors, they come up with this idea that about 80% of um, entries in the bibliography are copied. Now, they ascribe that, therefore, those have no meaning. I would say they might have meaning, but it gives an indication that up to 80% may be completely redundant. We came up with a very similar figure a different way. So, if I'm right and transitive reduction is removing poor citations, yeah, things that weren't needed for the flow of information, um, as I said, oh, this is the... So sort of conjecture, but maybe the real impact of a paper lie between the citation graph where I've reduced, done transitive reduction, removed all these redundant or unnecessary links, as opposed to the citation count, which is what actually is written in reality. This is the one we use. This is actually trivial to calculate. Yeah. To my mind, you could give both numbers, and then you can make up your own mind about whether that tells you something about the paper. So what happens in practice? This is one of the early things we did. Lo and behold, uh, this is the degree distribution of HEPTH, so the string theory uh, part of the archive. For This is the KDD cut data, about 10 years of data from the start. I think we threw away the first year or two. Uh, there's various issues with that. This is the degree distribution afterwards. Both are fat-tailed. You can see up here some of the papers have up to a thousand, more than a thousand citations, string theory. Down here, they're still getting up to a hundred. Uh, both fat tail, but there's a big change. And in fact, lo and behold, without even trying, we found that transitive reduction is removing 80% of the edges, which is surprisingly similar to the sort of numbers that other people have come up with. So I'm not saying that's a proof, you can't prove these things. You'd have to do a lot more uh, analysis of the context. You'd have to go in and understand what was going on, which, which ones are being removed. It becomes a social science study. Usually you end up uh, mostly counting only the first papers, correct? Yes, so the earliest papers the are earliest the ones papers. that tend to, uh, yes, because going back, yes, by definition, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, this is later than that one. So that could be part of it. Um, I'll come on to one or two ideas. I haven't, oh, let's come on. We looked at the Supreme Court judgment. So a, a Supreme Court, you want to back up your judgment about, uh, most, most of them are, seem to be about sex or pornography. When well, we looked into examples, we, anyway, uh, there's a lot of litigation about uh, that. Um, it would turn out you would back up your argument, your decision, by referring to older, older uh, paper, uh, older judgments. So it's a citation network. And I think what's happening here is very much like us. We want to back up our great paper by linking it to the Barabasi Albert, the Einstein, the, uh, whatever our favorite old paper is. And they seem to want to go back to the founding fathers or something. So if you take all of this away, what is it? It's about 75% of the uh, citations have gone. But if you look at patterns, there's clearly something different going on there. We lost only about 15%. And what I think is happening here is that when you're trying to develop a pattern, you're trying to say you're very new. You don't want to cite everything that's related to yours. So you're trying to say that I'm unique and different. And you're trying to say what is legally minimum amount you have to do. Uh, again, because I don't work in these areas, I haven't followed this up in great detail. But it was very interesting to see that even within citation networks, the transitive reduction is throwing up some interesting patterns worth thinking about. Uh, because we understand citations of academic papers, we did have a poke around. So this is the HEPTH, this is the citation count before I did transitive reduction, and citation count after. And you see there are winners, if, if nothing changed, you'd be on this line. 
you can see that it's quantized, you know, one citation, two, three, four, uh, so on and so forth. Let's look at some of the winners and losers. It's always probably most useful to look at the outliers. Now, these two are both uh, famous string theory papers. They've got a uh, co-author in common, Gubza. And for some reason, this one goes from 1,600 citations to three. This one goes from 800, which is still pretty good, but only comes down to 77. Uh, what is the difference between those two? We've, we hypothesized that maybe somehow this was relevant much more uh, cross-disciplinary. And so a lot more people were citing it. Um, I mean, there's only a year apart. This is 99, this is 98. Uh, this one is a sort of key paper. I think everyone cites this and one of what you can see. Uh, three other papers. I think you'd have to go in and really understand, in this particular case, the history or the string theory, and I, I don't understand enough about it. I did, as I said, wonder whether this was somehow more cross-disciplinary, maybe condensed matter applications. This was just purely for a narrow band of string you know, uh, theoretical mathematician string theorists. We tried to do various measures on that, and it didn't. We weren't convinced we we got anything. We weren't convinced ourselves, so that's sort of where we got to. That you can do some very simple things, you could quote both these numbers, and you can make up your own mind whether this is a good paper or not, whether this is a better paper or not. Uh, and if you look up the literature on sort of algorithms for transitive reduction, it's particularly simple, it's order n, so it's a very easy uh, thing to run. Okay, so. As I said, transitive reduction is a very simple thing to do. It seems to throw up some interesting results. I just haven't decided what they mean yet. Fine. So that's a, that was one of the early things I did. Uh, yeah, exploiting some of the special properties of directed acyclic graphs. Let me ask a question on, yeah. on the transitive reduction a bit. Um, so is there an underlying assumption that uh, the innovation in a paper is uh, unique. Is uh, so if I cite a paper, I cite all the innovation that's inside uh, that paper. Could that be that one paper has multiple uh, yeah. factors of innovation? So yes, I'm I'm referring to one aspect and another uh, author is referring so to another aspect, so it would make it less that's reusable, right. so, probably. So this this is one of the problems. So what is the meaning of a citation? Uh, one. One paper, as you said, maybe have, a, instead of being diverse in terms of being interesting to one idea, interesting to many fields, it could be that it has many ideas and different papers pick off different ideas. Mm -hmm. Again, you would need to develop more sophisticated measures. So if a, someone who's working in bibliometrics has access, I don't know, text analysis or uh, maybe has a labeled set, but as far as I can see, to really go into this, you do have to have a set of experts who read the papers and can really interpret. And it's been done, but it, we're back into social science, where they've done it for a set of 100, 200 papers for a, in a specialized area, often in scientometrics. So I sort of left it there, because uh, I decided to, to really delve into it. I'd need to do, know a lot more. I tried a few tricks, maybe text analysis. Well, I'm not an expert there. Maybe, yeah, that's a sort of student project I have in the back of my mind, you could play around. Because the KDE cut also provided the text for these papers, so we could do text analysis. Thank you. Okay, let me, sort of second half of the talk, I'll talk about um, another aspect which links up to a topic that a lot of people have been interested in, in different ways, particularly over the last 10 years, but in, in other ways, much, uh, it's been, been thinking about it for much longer. And that's sort of network geometry. So networks and geometry. So when we think about networks, we're almost always thinking Euclidean. I mean, because we're human. We, we, you know, it's a flat table. We measure distances to the tube in a sort of Euclidean way. Um, you know, wireless networks exist in the real world to use uh, random geometric graphs, which 
all based around Euclidean metric. Network visualizations, you know, if you look behind the scene of how they're doing, they're trying to lay something out on a plane. So it's not surprising many of them uh, are working with Euclidean metrics somewhere. And even if you have a high dimensional system, as we do with uh, big data, so many of the methods, at least in the simplest implementations, uh, are based on Euclidean metrics. You know, when you're principal component analysis, using Euclidean metrics for the high dimensional space to try and uh, project down onto a lower, maybe six, five dimensional space. But they're all based around these metrics. Now I know there are generalizations, you can look at more complicated manifolds, but formally they all have um, positive uh, signatures. That the, eigen the eigenvalues of the metric technically are positive. They're all spatial or Riemannian uh, uh, manifolds that are working with it, uh, which the Euclidean is the easiest to picture. Uh, more recently, people have got uh, interested, certainly in the sort of work I'm interested in, people like Kriyakov have been uh, pushing the idea that many examples could be embedded not in Riemannian space, but uh, hyperbolic space. And uh, I was telling Paola yesterday, my favorite uh, result from discovery from the autumn was discovering that the uh, better lattice, which is a classic simple example I used in my course earlier this year to explain percolation, actually, and, and typically I told my students it's infinite dimensional. What I really meant is if I try and embed it in Euclidean space, I'd need a, an infinite dimensional space because of the way the numbers of nodes grow as you move away from a center a chosen point. Turns out you can embed it in H2, the second uh, two-dimensional hyperbolic space, which I didn't know. So now it depends, when I say to the kids that it's two-dimensional, well, without thinking, I'd assumed Euclidean space. I'm sure they did. Uh, and I'm not sure what it means, whether it helps. I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't help physicists to tell them, British physicists anyway, to tell them that it's embedded in H2 quite easily. Anyway, but for me, of course, the big question is, well, that's great. If you've got a spatial, if that's an appropriate representation, of what, a space to embed your stuff in. But what if there's a time dimension? What if you've got a citation graph? Surely, yeah, everything tells me it should be a space time. And as like a good physicist, I know my Minkowski space is same but different from Euclidean. Uh, things, yeah, aren't, aren't normal. Uh, now, of course, the causal quantum set, gravity, the causal set, quantum gravity people, that's the natural language. So all their works being without, you know, they immediately start from Minkowski space. So that was a sort of question I was beginning to ask. So I see myself as just trying to push that it shouldn't just be spatial networks, it should be space-time uh, geometries that we're interested in. Uh, so these are questions that people might ask in general, but I'm just sort of adding, I should say, spatial space-time coordinates. But you could ask things like, what is the dimension of space or space-time? You know, do we need a time dimension to, to do our MDS, our multi-dimensional uh, scaling analysis to reduce the data? Can I assign coordinates to represent my network, maybe to ho help uh, routing problems? Should they be space-time? Do you need curvature? You know, should it be Euclidean or hyperbolic, which is what Kriyakov and friends <coughs> How would I measure these things? How would I establish them? And I've already mentioned that uh, there are also other types of space that perhaps you don't normally encounter when you're looking at geometry, like the box space that I mentioned, or the cube space I mentioned at the beginning. Okay, so I'm running short of time. So I'll just tell you, I think, mostly about dimension. Let's start at the beginning. You know, if my citation network is going to have any meaning in terms of the geometry, Surely the first thing you need to do is establish whether it's got a dimension in space-time. So how would you do that? Well, as I said at the beginning, you just do the simplest thing. So Minkowski space is the simplest uh, version of space-time. It's the flat, zero curvature, um, uh, homogeneous and isotropic space. The key thing to remember is that when you measure distances in space-time, you need to change the way you measure the distance. You work in proper time. You work in time squared minus the um, spatial coordinate squared. So this part for the spatial coordinates is the Euclidean distance. 
but you have to subtract uh, the, the square of the time to get the distance. So this immediately causes a lot of problems, uh, particularly even in me, who is used to, I'm used to working with spaceships and trains traveling close to the speed, speed of light and getting shorter. Yeah, you know, I've done all that, but still, I, yeah, I find it very difficult to visualize. I have to let the maths do it. So, so often I, I make assumptions that are really Euclidean based. Anyway, so the idea would be that I've got a DAG and I'm trying to embed it uh, in, say, Minkowski space. Let's do the simplest example. And I'm going to start by trying to find the dimension. Um, yes, I mentioned. So the model I have in mind is suppose that the, the simplest model would be let's throw points down at random in our space time. So here's a two dimensional space time, pass on point process, equal likelihood of a point at any, uh, any point in space time. That gives me the coordinates. I'm now going to connect them if they're causally connected. So this point will connect to anything in its future light cone, like that. Anything in its past light cone will be connecting to me. Now, this is the sort of model that the quantum theory, uh, quantum gravity people play with. Very simple model. I'll connect them all up. The idea is I'll throw away the uh, space time, take the network, and see whether I can reconstruct the coordinates. Or, in this case, or well, first job is can, given the network that emerges from this picture, can I measure the dimension accurately? So that's the game. Um, yes, yeah, so I said they're connected, causally connected. In this case, it's uh, transitively complete. One of the things you have to remember, though, uh, what you discover uh, early on, is that if, this is a, a good example of where your everyday network understanding goes wrong, is that we're used to, in normal sort of friendship, social networks, to be thinking of the shortest path all the time. Many of the centrality measures, importance measures in network theory use the shortest path between this and so on and so forth. Turns out, and, and there's a good reason for that, which well, I can highlight later, but it turns out that in these simple Minkowski space models, you can prove, and this is Brightwell, St. Brightwell at LSE and Ruth Gregory, uh, way back, showed that the longest path in these networks is the thing, given that I know that the, 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 in this model it comes from a space time, they've proved, at least for the Minkowski Poisson point process uh, models, that the longest path is the thing that approximates the geodesic. So the geodesic is the thing that represents, if you like, the, the direct route, the route that a, a free particle would follow in going from one space time point to another. Okay. Um, and it's conjectured, and there's a, some numerical evidence for more complicated space times. But it's a very narrow case. I'll prove by example here. Here's one of these Poisson point processes. I connect to anything in the future. I've displayed it as a Hasse diagram, so I've thrown away, I've done transitive reduction. This is the geodesic, it's a straight line in this flat space time. The, the blue highlights the longest path, which is well defined. You can only go forward in time. So there will only be a finite number of steps in it. And this blue path will scale in proportion to the uh, proper time difference. The shortest path, now remember I've thrown away uh, uh, many of the edges, but the shortest path here is this yellow. Now you have to remember shortest is measured with this different metric. So shortest, these ones have essentially zero proper time. They're out along the light cone, if this was a, uh, what was called the light cone. Those are the shortest leaps. And one thing that you realize is the triangle inequality is the wrong way around. In, the, in these non-Riemannian, this Minkowski space, you do have a triangle inequality that's the longest round. So the hypotenuse is longer um, than the sum of the other two, uh, well, two sides here. Yeah. So it goes the wrong way around. Okay, so that's meant to be a proof by example. You can try it. How do you measure the dimension? Well, the first thing you do if you're doing percolation theory, you just count the number of points in the box and count the size, and then look at the size of the box. So the point about the longest path was I'm going to use the longest path from the beginning to end. The, the box is any point that's on a path from the beginning to the end. So I count up all the points on any path. Again, that's relatively easy to do computationally, so the order end, uh, and 
the longest part is easy. So that's great. So I take a, a model, I take a network that I've created out of a real space time, and I see whether this gets me the right dimension. And that was actually the basis of this uh, uh, Bonaparte and Brightwell proof. You can prove it, you can do it both analytically and numerically. That's correct. There's a second way, which I won't go into, this comes out of the quantum gravity people. So I've got two different ways of measuring dimension. The real question is, great, I can do this toy model in Minkowski space, it works, and I get the right dimension, but I've got the right answer. What do you get if you do a social network, a citation network? Now this is what really set me going, because I just assumed that, oh, in a social network, the dimension measure will just get bigger and bigger as you get larger and larger boxes, reflecting the fact that it's really infinite dimension. To my great surprise, uh, this is the work with James Clough, and uh, some colleagues in earlier work. This is the two dimension measures for the HEPTH, the string theory archive again. What you can see is both these measures are coming in round about two, consistent. And as this is the size of the interval. Uh, after an initial sort of uh, phase, it settles down very rapidly to a, pretty much a constant. Now, I wasn't expecting that. And when you do it for, here's the particle phenomenology part of the same uh, citation network. The string theory is some dimension just above two. The particle physicists at CERN and Fermilab, they're closer to three. So not only do they seem to have consistent, it seems to make sense to embed these networks in a Minkowski space time of one plus one dimension, two plus one, but there are interesting differences. Uh, I'll put two and three to help you. And we ran it through some of the data sets we had, so uh, patterns of some interesting features, astrophysics need to be higher dimensional. Uh, the main use of this is that I can talk to my string theory neighbors and tell them that they work in a very narrow field, but now I can prove it. That they're only two dimensional, but you know, I'm clearly, well, I didn't have staffies on here, but clearly we'll, we'll be multi dimensional, because yeah, we know that. Okay. Um, let me wrap up a little bit. You could go on from this. So a lot of the modern work has been talking about curvature, Euclidean versus hyperbolic. We did, and this is James in his PhD thesis, he did go on to generalize those measures. You can do the same sort of thing if, there was, if you're working on a curved background that's the sitter space, and technically or anti the sitter space, you can generalize those formulae. There'll be another parameter for the curvature. Um, what we found again was, as you looked at larger systems, any measure for the curvature tended to settle down uh, to something relatively small. Earth's dimension, this is curvature. Um, we didn't find any strong evidence for curvature, except in the emails associated with uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, don't ask me. Uh, again, we haven't followed that up. That's in his thesis. So, to my great surprise, and that's why I think this area may have more traction, when I worked with real data sets, it did at least seem to be uh, a sensible uh, dimension that I could associate if I tried to embed these things in a flat Minkowski space, the simplest space time rather than a Euclidean space. So that was very interesting. Now, I think we're coming to the end, so I'll just mentioned that of course the next thing to do if, you, if you're sure you can embed it in Mankowski space for a given space-time dimension, we'll just go and do it. So we did work on this. Easy to calculate the distance between two points. It's the longest path, one, one, two, three. It's more difficult to connect, to calculate the distance between two points that are not connected, so space-like separated. So we did a little trick, only really worked on two, Whereas if you draw a little uh, diamond like that, if this is three apart, then in uh, some point process, on average, these two would be minus three apart. Doesn't work in higher dimensions, but hey, we, we used it. And I think because you've got so much statistics, so many pairs you can look at, actually it worked. This is multi-dimensional scaling, uh, and you have to do some tricks with double centering. The main thing here is that the metric's different. So on first, first sight, all the algebra behind MDS 
breaks down. But one of the things we did is we just changed the metric, and lo and behold, all these tricks, like double centering, worked. Uh, you can prove that. I'll just finish by showing you. So again, let's let's put a, a, a Minkowski space, random point, so I know the space-time dimension. Throw away the space-time, look at the uh, network, and see whether this method can reconstruct the coordinates or a reasonable approximation. So this is two dimensions, uh, one plus one, one plus three, one plus two, and this is just a random DAG, so you've got a time direction. These are the eigenvalues. Uh, I think it's arranged so that a negative eigenvalue is the time direction. Now there's no proof that we would find uh, exactly one negative of one positive. And you can see, of course, there's numerical noise. Uh, well, our method isn't perfect, but you can see a very clear separation. But, you know, if I was doing MDS, I'd say, right, I take these two. But it's very interesting, you get this uh, negative eigenvalue, and the eigenvector associated with that is pulling out the time direction. And that's true in all these other cases. You get one, two, three, and it's getting, you know, they're getting closer and closer as you go to higher dimension, not surprisingly. Um, so this method really does work. This again is the plus on point process before and afterwards, and I assure you we don't have not fixed anything. For instance, these two points over here are a bit closer in this diagram, but they're remarkably good. We have worked on real data sets with this sort of Lorentzian version of MDS, and you, you can use area of the curve. You, you look to see whether edges in the real network uh, are predicted to exist as sort of link prediction. Uh, method when you use the space-time coordinates that we give them, and again, we were running at a 90% success. Now, that's far better than I expected. I made all sorts of assumptions. Let's just use Minkowski, the simplest space, nothing complicated. So they're far more embeddable in Minkowski space than I would expect. Is that useful? I don't know. Uh, as a theorist, I was very interested to see you could even change the, uh, the model from a space to a space-time, that you could work with it. Um, okay, uh, the, the, I've gone on to look at various other things, some community detection, um, which is interesting, uh, just because in, in things, papers published at the same time, uh, in, in the same area, are not connected, you can't cite them. So in a sense, the people that are most similar to you, that are the same age, the same area, are not connected. So unlike most community or clustering methods, the edge does not directly indicate similarity. So actually, we wanted to collect things together that were not connected. So I just love that idea. Again, how useful is it? I don't know, but we found a way to get that to work. And then you can play around with some analytic work in some of the simplest models. So that was quite nice. OK, let me just see if I can flip through to the end, see if there's a nice summary. Invite me back for part two if you want. And that's price model. Blah, blah, blah. So if you went to Singapore, you would have seen this. <laughs> I'm sure you came along. Oh, there we go. So the summary. So, I mean, it's a very simple summary that, that when you have an order, often it's an arrow of time. When you're working with a directed cyclic graph, you really must take that into account. There are some really, it's quite fun. There's some really interesting special properties of directed acyclic graph. I mean, things like betweenness. Most graphs use the shortest path. Uh, with my current student, Viva, she's got a whole chapter on her thesis uh, about using longest path and whether that's effective. So I think that's basically the, the main message. Uh, there are several students and PhD students I've worked with, Lucille, James. Jamie, Tamar, and now uh, Bonita. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, regarding like the embedding, you know? Yeah. Uh, there is this uh, uh, like method by La Casa with the, um, uh, the visibility graph. Yes. I, I come across that, yes. That actually takes a time series and embedded into a directed acid, I mean, in, into a directed acid graph. Yeah. Uh, so maybe 
I'm thinking about like uh, trying to embed the visibility graph in yeah, the one. I hadn't thought of that. And then maybe you, you find out some good like because you know markets have like states there yes, and more. Yeah. So maybe like in a better state uh, the Minkowski Yeah. Yeah, you know. So yeah, I mean I've no idea what the repeat the question. Can you repeat the question, sorry for oh. Uh, so the question was that you, there are these methods that look at visibility graphs, um, and I, I do remember talks so that they use time series, uh, and I think it's an analogy with a method used actually in archaeology and um, in other contexts. But nevertheless, you can use it at time series uh, to analyze, analyze in some way. And the question seemed, suggested something I hadn't noticed that they also define a directed acyclic graph. And my basic thesis is that then there's a whole range of interesting new tools that you should use to analyze that, whether that's useful. I think it's quite possible. Um, I'm not saying any of these tools are an instant solution. It may well be just easier to analyze the graph, throw away the time direction, and maybe just analyze it with the usual thing. Maybe you'll get the results or the information you need that way. Uh, maybe you cross the papers together based on the undirected graph. But I'm saying there may also be really inf useful information by keeping the time. I, I, I personally feel often. So I don't know about that context. It's a very interesting one. Um, if, yeah. That's great. That's another student project for me. <laughs>